Hi, welcome to the Fly Fishing Show Zoom video series, and we're happy you guys are here. My name is Rob Giannino of the Fly Fishing Journeys podcast, and tonight I'm excited to have uh, the American Saltwater Guides Association, uh, both Willie Goldsmith, who the, who's the executive director, as well as Tony Friedrich, who's the policy director. Guys, thanks for being on the Zoom series. Great Thank to be you. here. Thank you, Rob. So as you guys know, this Zoom series is brought to you by the Fly Fishing Show. And the show season runs from January till March. And we kick off in January at the Denver Show, which is the first weekend of March. And we run all the way through the middle of March when we finish up at the Lancaster Show in Pennsylvania. And uh, before we get deep into things, I want to introduce you guys and have you guys give us your resumes. Willie, we know that you have a doctorate degree. You're a doctor. Your doctor fly fishing. How awesome is that? <laughs> Doesn't get much better, Rob. Yeah. And so why don't you tell, a little, tell us a little bit about your background, your schooling. I know you've got Harvard in there somewhere, and then how you became the recent executive director with the association. He was, sure. he was the maintenance staff at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the digs came out early there, Tony. We haven't even got into it. So yeah, sure, uh, Rob. First off, uh, thanks so much for having us on today. You know, excited, uh, excited to share with the Fly Fishing Show folks. Uh, you know, some details about ASGA and who we are and what some of what we're working on. Uh, a bit about me: uh, I'm a Boston native, like you. Uh, you know, from Massachusetts. Um, grew up fishing downtown Boston. You know, catching stripe, catching a large mouse and carp. You know, out of out of uh, shopping carts and bed frames and whatever other structure I could find in the river where they were holding, uh, catching stripers up in, up in Gloucester and fishing for cod and stuff on party boats. I um, really, you know, fell in love with fishing at a young age, worked on tackle shops, uh, worked in tackle shops through, uh, through high school. And um, yeah, basically, you know, as, as you said, you know, I did my undergrad at Harvard, I continued catching fish in the Charles through that, um, then did some fisheries research around the country, um, including up in Maine and out in um, California, uh, doing some, some swordfish work. Uh, and then uh, did my PhD at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which is part of the College of William and Mary uh, down in Southern Virginia, working on um, the recreational bluefin tuna fishery, looking at uh, both post-release mortality, which is how many fish survive when folks catch them and let them go. And then also doing a lot of really interesting uh, human dimensions research. So trying to understand um, you know, where anglers find value in fishing. And we've found unsurprisingly that there's a lot of value uh, and catch and release fishing, you know, it's not just about harvest, it's also about catching those fish and having that experience. So um, after that, I spent some time in Washington, D.C., um, working on Capitol Hill as a uh, NOAA Sea Grant Canals Fellow with Senator Ed Markey, working on a bunch of marine policy and, and fisheries issues there. That's actually where I met Tony, uh, working on some legislation with him. Um, then worked in the uh, marine science grant making world for a bit and uh, joined ASGA as their executive director about two months ago now. Um, you know, super excited to be here. Certainly uh, the philosophy that we have, which I think Tony will describe in a bit more detail around maximizing, uh, recognizing the value of fish left in the water as a, as a real key uh, tenet of our, of our mission and our goals here. So, uh, you know, thrilled to be here and uh, thrilled to chat a bit more about, uh, about what we do. Awesome. Awesome. So just dialing back there. So the one, one of the fish that I haven't caught, I'm trying to catch Jeff Courier in the number of species on a fly. And one of one of my targets is the bluefin tuna on a fly, which would be amazing. Yep. So I understand you're the guy to help me with that, or maybe you can I, connect I, me. I, I can do what I can, but I think Lady Luck is probably more of what you need than anything I can tell you, Rob. <laughs> yes, I for would, sure. I would suggest a workout regimen, and what what you should do is lean over the toilet and have your wife beat you with a baseball <laughs> bat while you throw money in it. And plug. again, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's the workout for uh, for bluefin tuna because it it's it's not a it's <laughs> it's rough. Do not consider how much money is spent per fish you will not like the answer Let's put right. it that way. so tony tell us a bit about your background how you got connected with the the guys association and your role as the policy director okay um i built the guides association with john mcmurray so that's our connection um yep john john is uh the president of the guides association he's out fishing right now and can't be on here um but about a year and a half ago, uh, well, go, going back 20 years, I've worked on a lot of fisheries issues, both state, regional, and federal levels, everything from forage species to striped bass, bluefish, speckled trout, cobia, red drum, you name it. Um, for almost a decade, I was the executive director of CCA. Um, 
a while back, I, I struck out on my own, uh, started my own fisheries policy, uh, small business, and now uh, work on mostly federal and regional issues, some state issues now with the COVID stuff. Uh, I'm the policy director now for the Guides Association. Like I said, John and I started that together about a year and a half ago on kind of like a, a wish and a prayer. Um, our, our voices were not being heard on uh, any kind of level in the saltwater community. Like Willie said, the value of fish left in the water, um, you know, there, there's more to it than just dockside value of a dead fish laying there. Um, our business models uh, are, are totally reflective on of the abundance of species. The more fish out there, the more people want to go fishing. Um, you can tell this over and over again through the data. Um, you know, the, the greater expectation to catch a fish, the more good reports, the more people are going to go out. Right. Uh, and the more people are going to hire us to take them. So, um, you know, been doing this for about 20 years. Like Willie said, we ran into each other on Capitol Hill, um, working on legislation together. And, uh, and he's probably the only person I've met in my life that is as nuts about fishing as I am. And just said, you know, this, this is our executive director. We gotta, we gotta make it happen. And, and here we are, you know, a year later, uh, it's, it's all still going all still firing on all cylinders and there's just, there's no shortage of work that needs to be done. So. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Going right into my next question, Willie, what is the mission of the American Saltwater Guides Association? Sure. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've touched on this a bit, Rob, um, you know, our mantra or our, our motto, if you will, is better business through conservation. Uh, I think Tony was alluding mm -hmm. to this uh, a bit earlier, you know, the, to the extent that, you know, we, we are not an anti-harvest group. We don't, you know, we, we're not a group to say, you know, nobody can keep any fish, but we also recognize that for some species in some situations, um, there's a lot more value in having a lot of fish in the water than there is being able to take as many fish home as you possibly can. Um, you know, we, we see over and over again that people don't tend to, don't tend to fight when there are a lot of fish in the water. Uh, a lot of the conflicts that we see are over uh, depleted stocks, over fish stocks, and there's, you know, a demand there and a lot of, a lot of uh, conflict that can arise. Um, so our goal is really, you know, we're a resource first group. We are looking after the fish first and recognizing that when the fish are in good shape, we're in good shape financially as well. Um, and that's really the main, the main goal that we try to, uh, you know, that we have pervade all of our, all of our, um, all of our efforts, you know, toward mm -hmm. that end. Um, we really, you know, pride ourselves in developing partnerships kind of across the uh, marine conservation community. You know, we may not always agree with, for example, a, a commercial fishery sector or an environmental group. Um, or, you know, some other, some other um, marine resource user. But when there are opportunities for us all to work together to achieve a shared goal, like we, we you know, embrace those opportunities. We really try to, try to do what's best uh, given the circumstance to improve the state of the resource. So that's kind of, that, that's kind of our, um, our main philosophy around this. And, you know, as Tony said, you know, we're, we're a guides association. You know, we represent the, the for hire fishing industry um, of folks who kind of share our vision, uh, but we also work on behalf of like-minded uh, Know, small bait and tackle shops and more manufacturers as well as kind of the general angling public who, who shares our shares our view that you know it's it's more important to have a lot of fish out there to be able to catch as opposed to just being able to you know as opposed to just being able to keep as many as you possibly can and not totally deplete the resource so that's kind of where we where we fall on a lot of these discussions and i don't know if you have anything else to add to that tony yeah, it just, you know, the, the better, better business through marine conservation is our tagline. And, um, you know, to kind of put it all together as simply as possible, Willie said we don't fight when there's a lot of fish. Um, the, the, way, the way that marine resources are managed now is the science comes down and then you have the policy side of it where you try to make everyone happy and still stick as much as you can to the science because everyone wants a slice of that pie. And, and our philosophy is pretty simple. We want to make the pie bigger. So you're not fighting over the last slice. And, you know, the only way you can do that is if you support science and you put the resource first. So while we're the guides association, we're really, I'm probably going to upset somebody when I say this, but we're on a, on a national scale, we're the only fisherman's group out there 
that will put the resource first, even if it hurts us, if it's what's best for the resource in the long run, it's what's best for everyone. So uh, we're, we're very much resource first driven in all of our decisions. And, Tony, and I would just, I would just echo, yeah, I would just jump off of that, you know, in terms of, um, you know, when, when could management hurt us? I think one thing that, um, you know, we really take a lot of pride in is being a science, you know, a science-based group. We, you know, we pride ourselves in being in touch with scientists, being aware and educating ourselves on like the latest state of, of what the research is showing and really using that information to help guide our efforts. Mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes those, we might not like the answers there, but it's, you know, the bottom line is we want to do what's in the best interest of the resource. And so we want to help contribute to the best available science. You know, we're currently exploring opportunities to be collaborators on some, on some research projects ourselves. So that's another big piece of what we try to do is really let the facts dictate our, uh, our actions. Tony, who are your members? So um, our, our members are guides right now from Maine to North Carolina. Um, we have, we've been so tied up with everything since Willie started kind of the current state of the world that we haven't been able to execute our, our ideas for expansion. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, we're just trying to take care of the people who are our current members instead of worrying about expanding to other areas. But right now it's, you know, our chairman owns Saltwater Edge, a, you know, a frequent, a frequent booth at the fly fishing shows. Um, uh, Peter Jenkins, he's obviously not a guide. He's a tackle shop owner, but you know, conservation directly dictates how well his business does. Uh, Richie Farino from district angling is another one of our uh, board members from DC another another participant in the fly fishing show he owns a shop he's not a guide um but we have probably the best guides on the east coast right now who are fully engaged fully bought into the concept of the guides association you know your jamie boyles your paul dixons your gene quigley's your john mcmurray's the guys who are in all the magazines with the big fish and you can't get the dates to book them you know because mm -hmm. they have their regular clients these are these are our board members and leaders in our membership. Um, and I'll tell you, it's grown so much. It's over a couple thousand members now. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to tell you everyone that we have. Because uh, yeah, we're just, we're, we're like going at breakneck speed. And but, <laughs> let me hard. ask you this question, Willie. Obviously, you guys provide the, the guides and incredible service through what you're doing with your association through enhancing the fisheries. But are there any benefits that a guide would have to being part of your community outside of what you guys do to enhance the fisheries? Yeah, I would say, I would say certainly, you know, the events of the past few months are a great example. I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, yes, we're a resource first group, but we're also, you know, working on behalf of these folks who make their living from being on the water. And so, you know, our goal is to do what we can to kind of help, uh, help them. Um, you know, when it's needed. And obviously the last few months have been a, you know, a huge disruption for everybody for the global economy and beyond. And certainly in our little niche in the, uh, in the for higher recreational fishing industry, it's been a, a huge blow. And so I think um, certainly, you know, in the past two months, a, a lot of states um, around the country, you know, explicitly banned uh, for higher fishing, which, you know, is, is not surprising. It's obviously there's a, you know, unprecedented public health crisis going on. And, uh, finding, you know, trying to minimize areas where folks are going to be in close contact makes a lot of sense. Uh, at the same time, of course, for a lot of a lot of our members, and frankly, you know, the entire industry, whether or not they're they're members of ASGA, you know, it's been a huge economic blow. And it's not just the fact that folks haven't been allowed in the water. It's basically looking forward here. You know, we're now about to be in early June, where a lot of the restrictions have been lifted to some extent across the states. You know, there's still you know guidelines around social distancing and what have you, but of course, there's going to be a long tail in terms of, you know, demand questions or people are going to want to go fishing. Um, and so I think a couple of things that we've done is certainly um, when a lot of states did kind of ratchet down and, you know, have had stay at home orders and everything else. We reached out to the governors of eight different states, um, often in conjunction with other partners from other um, recreational fisheries uh, organizations, you know, not not claiming to be public health professionals, not saying that, um, you know, we know better than anybody else. We certainly don't around what's safe and what isn't but simply asking that during phase one um, lifting of COVID related restrictions uh, that the for hire industry be considered to be part of that. And we've been fortunate to see a lot of guys uh, getting back on the water as part of phase one, which were, which were yeah, really you know, Rob, we're, we're policy, Willie and I, you know, if there's 
kind of one trick ponies, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're fisheries policy experts. And because of what's happened, we have now turned into fisheries disaster relief experts and, and appropriations experts. And uh, I, I mean, just small business administration experts, small business administration, <laughs> PPP loan experts, you know, it's not, it's, it's definitely out of our wheelhouse. We met the challenge, but you know, the question was besides making sure there's fish in the water for our guys to catch and make sure that we're putting the resource first, we kind of shifted gears unexpectedly and turned into a true trade association where, you know, we were talking with guys every day, North Carolina, you know, having a problem with their unemployment system. Um, you know, guys in, guys in Massachusetts having success with small businesses for the, for, with uh, small banks with the PPP loans versus larger banks who weren't paying attention to them. And yep. you kind of, you know, we're aggregating all this, information at breakneck speed and trying to make sure that our guys can still pay their mortgages and send their kids to school uh, and not knowing, not really being a hundred percent sure what we're doing the whole time. So, you know, we kind of, we morphed into, you know, this, this incredible, you know, decades of experience of fisheries policy into shifting and, and, and leveraging our contacts on Capitol Hill and in other states and in other governor's offices and really protecting our members who, who by and large are our friends. So sure. it's very personal for us. You know, Willie and I were on the phone a couple of, maybe like a month ago and we, we scored a big win and uh, he was like, man, this feels really good. And I said, yeah, you know, how many times can you go to sleep at night and put your head on a pillow and say, you know, my, my buddy's going to be able to pay his mortgage this month Yeah, because we just found a little clause in the law and and we made sure that they're they're taken care of. So you know we take a lot of pride in that. We're helping out our friends. This is a very small community, and that's uh, awesome. And the, per the personal relationships are there, so it's it's very very personal for us. Willie, let's talk about the actual fly fishermen. I mean, obviously you guys are protecting fisheries. You're helping to make sure that there's more fish in the water for fly fishermen to catch. But let's talk about uh, you know waders or wading boots in the sand. How are you guys helping the everyday fly fishermen to have a better experience? Sure. Uh, so first off, Rob, I would say that, you know, certainly, you know, the fly fishing community is a huge, you know, is a huge part of our, of our world. And obviously most fly fishermen subscribe to a very strong conservation ethic, but we're certainly not exclusive to the fly fishing community. I think anybody who fishes in a way that, you know, that, that, under, that kind of shares our mission and values, you know, is, is, is a welcome member of our group, you know, whether, you know, you're fishing natural bay with a circle hook, you know, or you're, you're throwing plugs or whatever you're doing, you know, it, yep. I think it's, it's really, it's more a matter of philosophy around the way that you're fishing as, and the, uh, you know, your mentality around it, as opposed to the gear you're using. So I uh, just you know, wanted to, wanted to note that to folks out there. Well um, said. Regarding the work that we're doing, we operate on a whole bunch of different levels. Um, I think the easiest way to break it down, um, there are a couple of different kind of like planes on which you can think about it. One is the geographic scope. So we do everything from state fisheries policy, you know, in terms of how a state might set its, its size and bag limits for a certain species, all the way up to federal, you know, federal fisheries laws or, you know, a, um, responses to executive orders, much broader um, national scale things that might affect all people. So we really operate, you know, across the entire spectrum geographically. Um, the other way to think about it is in terms of the, the types of, uh, of policy we're working with. And there are kind of two different kinds. One is what you would call like policy implementation, um, which is more, again, the idea of setting regulations, um, you know, rebuilding overfish stocks, allocating a harvest between, you know, different sectors in a fishery, uh, those kinds of things. And then the other thing that we work on is what you would call policy formulation, which is really legislation. And that's obviously the, the broader kind of umbrella directives that Congress gives folks, you know, in those implementation levels to, to do something. So, you know, the main fisheries law that we work on is the, the Madison-Stevens Act, which is the, the main federal fisheries law governing how, how we manage our, our fisheries resources. Um, and then everything that we so we, you know, we work on on that on that law. Um, you know, it's it's thought that there's going to be an upcoming reauthorization, and so we'll be trying to get some uh, some additional conservation um, measures put in there, as well as um, our ideas around adapting to climate change and and um, protecting the entire, you know, accounting for the entire ecosystem as opposed to just single species management. We'll we'll work, you know, on that broad 
federal legislative effort. And then we'll also work on the, you know, the very granular, um, you know, size limits, closed areas, what have you, that that law dictates at a, at a, um, at a regional or, or state level. So yeah, really op we operate kind of wherever we need to, um, you know, wherever there's, wherever there's a clear priority and a, and a need for us to, to, you know, to allocate our time. Rob, the big difference, you know, I think a lot of the listeners or people may listen to this after, uh, you know, after it's just, it's on y'all's Facebook page, the, the big difference between like freshwater trout or smallmouth or whatever, you know, sweetwater fish and what we do, um, you know, there, we have one law, the Magnuson Stevens Act that governs everything from three to 200 miles out. So you have to, you have to constantly tweak that law to account for changing situations um you know and and while look okay, i so you know take an issue willie brought up climate change you know you, you take an issue like climate change and it, it may be impacting you know brook trout uh in their southern regions right now um you know can can they make it and can they still make it in north carolina with things getting warmer well you know you can work on that you know, stream by stream with the state and restoration projects, but we work on issues like, okay, so, you know, the things in the Chesapeake Bay right now that we're catching are not what we were catching 10 years ago. You know, we're catching cobia, big red drum, it's the best speckled trout year we've had in 30 years. Um, striped bass will always have a home in the Chesapeake, but it's not going to be as friendly for them moving 10 years out. So, you know, what, what's the next big striped bass breeding ground? Is it the St. Lawrence River? This is the Hudson and the Raritan. Are they going to take over more? But, you know, we're, we're working on long-term issues. You know, how does that impact, how does that impact fly fishermen? Look, every time I drive over the Bay Bridge and I see, see a school in Menhaden, it makes my heart swell up with pride yeah. because, you know, we fought like the Dickens back in, you know, 2010, 2012 to, to get, you know, the Bay caps and, and reduction on the Menhaden fleet, the Omega fleet. And every time I see a school in Menhaden, I know those stripers have something to eat. And that's a lasting, meaningful thing, you know, that, that I accomplished outside of the Guides Association. But some of the stuff that we do, like reauthorizing Magnuson, will have, you know, impact on the listeners, the attendees to this webinar. It'll have an impact on their fishing for the next decade. I mean, we're playing high stakes poker here. Um, it, it is not, it is not like let's, and I'm not denigrating anyone, you know, God bless you if you're helping to restore a trout stream. But we're, a lot of the stuff that we're working on is top level coastal stuff uh, that, that has massive implications. And then we have to follow that down the tree and, and make sure it's executed properly in each region or each state. So, I mean, the, the, layers, the layers and the complications with saltwater fisheries and everyone who shares the space and wanting to be a good player, be a good partner with everyone. We don't pick winners. We're not going to say, well, that we can have them and you can't. That's not, that is not good policy. So to manage in all of that is it's a, yeah, that's what we do for the guys who are going to have their waders in the sand this weekend, you nice. know, and it's, it's stuff that, you know, the stuff that you're seeing today is the stuff that we worked on five years ago. Willie, thank you for that. Willie, can you explain the Magnuson Stevens act for the listeners who might not be familiar with it? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, you know, I think uh, so. The Madison Stevens Act was signed into law in 1976. Uh, so, you know, it's 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 been around for a while. Um, it's been reauthorized a couple of times. Um, you know, it actually has been very helpful for increasing some of the conservation measures, uh, especially in terms of, you know, having very strict uh, timelines for recovering stocks. Um, as Tony mentioned, you know, it governs all, governs all federal fisheries in U.S. waters from three to 200 miles offshore. And basically provides, you know, provides a, a, you know, a prescriptive guidance for how the regional fishery management councils, and there are eight of those around the country, um, for how each of those um, should go about developing management plans for, for each of the fisheries and, uh, and ensuring their health moving forward. So it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty broad reaching, broad reaching law. Um, and, uh, you know, it's by and large been quite successful in rebuilding stocks. We think there are areas where it could be even further improved. I mean, Obviously, a lot has changed since since the uh, since the mid to late seventies, and you know there have been uh, subsequent reauthorizations to to adopt some of those changes. But there's there's some other um, some other efforts. That we so, Willie, make. just for the for the for the listeners, you know, we we use little catchphrases, and sometimes it doesn't you know it it doesn't resonate understandably because we have our own little weird language. 
about every about every ten years, you take a you take a real broad sweeping law like Magnet the Magnus and Stevens Act, and you reauthorize it. And by reauthorizing it, you rewrite certain sections, you add certain sections, you may take out a section, but the concept is that everyone sits down and works together for like years. Yeah, right. It's not one meeting. <laughs> you hash out what you want, what they want, what makes sense. Mm -hmm. And you try to come to a consensus and then you have to get everyone in the house and the Senate to agree on it. And the president's got to sign it. And, and then you it's basically by saying reauthorizing, we're updating the language and the legislation to fit the changing times that we're seeing. Um, so I'm clear. It's like all fish that swim in the ocean are one on one act. So, um so the fish fisheries that are managed by the councils and like willie said there's eight regional Federal. councils but uh, like the striper and like the bluefin and so a minute this is, like this is where it, i'm not i'm probably going to make you more confused and not help out uh striped bass because you're not allowed to catch them more than three miles out right the, the law right now says you, you should not be targeting even catching early stripers more than three miles out this striped bass and several other species are managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is not a council, it's an interstate compact um, that was designed in World War II to help feed the nation, right, during, during the war. And, and it is, it's stayed around um, and it manages a lot of the inshore fisheries. Okay. Uh, the councils manage a lot of the offshore fisheries and then on top of all of that, you have the HMS fisheries, which are highly migratory species like your tuna, your billfish, things like that. And they're managed under a HMS or Willie's on the advisory panel for ICAT, which is a global group to manage tunas. Okay. So I wish I could have a simple question that would just be like, boom, silver yeah. bullet, that answers it. But even some species are shared. Between there, yeah, there. the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the Mid-Atlantic Council. So it, the, the short answer is yes, but there's different layers of management and it gets really, really confusing. But by and large, if it's a, if it's a fish and you can go to these websites, you can go to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission website. It's a great website just to learn from it's got stock status updates a, a, a good portion of the science they do a really good job with the website you can go to the mid-atlantic council or the new england council's website and see what fish they manage and you can see the crossover but the the short answer to your question is generally yes okay and Magnus what is the when you say the eight uh willie you talk about like this eight different councils yes what is so the northeast is it just the north northeast? new england New England, so there's the New England Fisheries Fishery Management Council, which is the New England, the New England Waters that manages, you know, most of your ground fish, um, Atlantic herring jointly with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, uh, spiny dogfish jointly with the Mid-Atlantic Marine Fisheries. So, you know, it gets, it gets a little bit messy, but by and large for New England waters, um, it's the New England Fishery Management Council. And then moving south, you have the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. So with like from, from like New York down? Yep. That's going to be the Mid-Atlantic Council. And then you'd have one in the Southeast for like Florida. And yeah, that's the South Atlantic. And then you have the Gulf Council, the Pacific Council. The, yeah. It's, and it's worth, it's worth noting, Rob, you know, these guys, these folks talk to each other. You know, there's a lot, there's a fair amount of coordination, especially, you know, one thing that we're thinking about a lot with, with Madison is, uh, is climate change, right? And so you've got a species, um, you know, like, like Cobia that, um, you know that that's the shifting northward, and so and so, how do you go about managing that species? And with Cobia, they ended up uh, shifting jurisdictions to the to the um, to basically the the inshore management entity. Um, but in other cases, for an offshore species, it might be different. So there's a lot of a lot of conversations there around kind of how to coordinate between the councils. Just this week, there was the uh, the meeting of the council coordination committee, which is when all councils come together and they basically catch up on, you know, the latest issues of the day and the various directives they have and kind of what, what they've been working on. So and if that, a, if, if that muddied the waters substantially, now you know why Willie and I get paid to do what we do. No, actually because it was good. I, I followed it. I was, I got informed. So I, appreciate I will, that. I will last, I will lastly just add, um, you know, for folks who do want to kind of understand the breadth of Magnuson and what it does, um, at the very beginning of the law, there are 10 national standards that kind of outline the main guiding principles. 
mm -hmm. which range for everything from, you know, um, managing for what's called the opt optimum yield to uh, protecting fish habitat, to ensuring safety of life, it's uh, safety of, of folks who are fishing at sea. It really gives you a great appreciation for the breadth of the breadth of the rulemaking or the uh, the, the law uh, that, that's kind of helpful for understanding what it's what its intent is. And that, you know, Rob, the last thing that I'll tell you is kind of like a funny aside that like a layman can kind of chuckle at. The Magnuson Stevens was created to keep foreign fleets out of our waters. I mean, that's. Yeah, when it, when it was passed in the 70s, you know, the old guys listening to this can probably remember rush, seeing Russian trawlers on the horizon in the early 70s, you know, scooping up all the fluke off the beaches in Jersey. And, and you know, the massive conflicts between our domestic fleets and those fleets and essentially the, the, one of the primary movers of that law being passed was to save our waters, you mm -hmm. know, 200 miles to inland. And then from three miles inland, the states manage those. Yep. So that's the best. We were protecting our waters from foreign interests. So. Where can somebody, Will, you talked about the ability for somebody to do a little bit more research. Is there a site, a website, or a Google yeah. search term that they could dig up? Um, yeah, so NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which, you know, is, is what the National Marine Fisheries Service is housed under. Um, if you Google NOAA Madison Stevens Act, they have a great yep. page that kind of outlines outlines the law that can be really helpful for digesting it. Um, okay, good stuff. So that's, that, that, that's a good start, I would say. Um, Let's talk, guys. I know there's been just you guys have been instrumental in helping a lot of the guides you know, try to get back to work or get participation in the PPP. Let's talk about this COVID-19 and how this has affected, like it's affected everything, how this has affected what you guys do in the saltwater guides and some of the things that you guys have done as an association to protect and enhance the guides, you know, work at this point. Yeah, so well, we're I, not uh, Willie. You, I'll, I'll do the quick one. You follow up with everything I forgot. As Willie stated, we are not health experts. Yeah. We don't know anything about this. Well, we didn't know anything about this stuff. And we had to, you know, run that razor's edge of doing everything humanly possible to get our guys back to work while adhering to the best science guidance available. So, you know, much like everyone else, we don't know anything about virus transmission and we want to keep people safe but we also want our guys to keep their homes yep so what we did was take what we think is the most responsible position possible and say hey look we understand that nobody knows what's going on and we're just trying to protect people at this juncture but when things start to open we want to be a part of phase one and because we we operate in open air um, we can we can adhere to the social distancing, the hygienic guidelines. We can we can do all of these things. You know, we're not a movie theater, right? We're not a we're not a, a restaurant that's going to pack a hundred people into a small room. We're we're taking a very small, usually six people or under, out on pretty big boats, where we can achieve all the goals. So our message was really twofold to the decision makers was we're, we're not, we're not going to complain too much about this because none of us know what's going on, but let's keep an open dialogue and let's get our guys out there in phase one for the reasons that I mentioned. And then also, which was really proactive, and I was very proud of the association for doing, was we came up with a list of guidelines. So we weren't complaining. We were offering solutions, mm -hmm. like real world solutions that we only understand because we're the people that are taking guys out on our vessels and what we could accomplish and what we couldn't accomplish. And working with, the, working with them in a meaningful way, you know, the first couple of states started opening up, my gosh, like the first week in May. And yeah. we, we were thrilled, you know, Wednesday, I think, Long Island was the hot spot. And we have so many guides. I think we have over 400 guides on Long Island that are members and they were shut out. And, and we were able to work real closely with Governor Cuomo's office um, you know, explain to them the terrible situation that we're in because we're all self-employed. 
It was really hard for us to even get looked at for PPP, uh, PPP loans. The unemployment insurance, we're, we're 1099 guys, self-employed. We don't normally, uh, we're, we're not normally eligible for, for unemployment. However, we were able to get some language included in there to where the states had to update their system. But in the meantime, it took weeks and weeks and weeks for the states to update their system, not being critical of them. You know, this is crazy, unprecedented times, but our guys are dying. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, just getting financially brutalized through all of this. And I think as we as each state. As each state opened up a little bit, it put more pressure on the other states, um, because, I mean, look, to be honest, being out on a boat is not going to start the next outbreak. Right. I mean, there's certain things that like we understand that you're not going to happen anytime soon. I think all of us, any of us who are parents are worried about their kids going back to school, you know, all of this stuff that like are the, are the unknowns, but like, my God, get out there and recreate on a boat, get out in the sun, like do, do something, you know, find some, find some emotional happiness during these crazy times. And, and it was that platform that allowed us to really work in a meaningful way with all the states and allow us to be opened as soon as the metrics said it was okay. And, you know, the last state fell. This week, our guys out in Long Island are booking trips like crazy. They're adhering to all the guidelines. We couldn't be happier for them. And, uh, and you know, we've, I think Willie and I both feel like we turned a corner. Our conversations in the morning are kind of like, what the heck do we do today? Mm -hmm. You know, for the last couple of months, all we've been doing 24 hours a day, seven days a week is try to get our guys back on the water. And it's accomplished now. So, like, now we got to shift gears and go back to the way things were. So, um, you know, it was – it was completely and utterly devastating to our community. You know, we have guys who spent 30, 40, $50,000 repowering their boats. They have insurance payments, they have dock payments, they have everything. And, and you know, it, it takes, if their season starts April, May, you know, sometimes even earlier, if you go down to our guys in North Carolina, like March, they lost all of that. So like normally they would have to work two months, let's say, to catch up on all the, the maintenance and the bills they have over the winter. And then they start making profits, you know, after that, we don't know what that's going to look like this year. Um, but we, our goal was to get them out on the water as quick as possible because the PPP loans were sucked up by huge companies before we could even touch them. The unemployment systems were broken and, and there was nothing. It was just a black hole and in a very scary place there for a while. And if uh, this in all in the 20 years, 20 something years I've been doing this, I can't tell you like it's probably the proudest I've ever been to really be helpful to our friends and our community and get them back on out on the water. And if I was filling out a resume, it would probably be at the top of the resume right now as far as like what the most meaningful thing that we've been able to do. So, sure. Willie, did I? I think uh, I think you covered it. OK. That's awesome. Um, we'll talk about a bit about uh, Willie, if you don't mind like what this has impacted like the small business like the fly shops even because i know they've had to deal with you know being closed i know uh tony did an awesome job covering the guys but what about like the small businesses like the small manufacturers and the fly shops because because i know you said you even have a you know a couple you know bigger fly shops as part of your board members there how, how have they had to deal with this COVID 19 about closing and trying to keep people on staff and Sure. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll let Tony jump in here as well. I think it's actually been pretty variable, um, believe it or not, Rob. Some, some shops have actually done comparatively well, especially, you know, um, in a lot of states, you know, most states, frankly, have been kind of um, promoting recreational fishing as like a, a healthy, you know, socially distant way to, to, to recreate, as, as Tony was saying. And so for that end, I think there's, you know, it, it's, been a, it's been a real roller coaster across the, different, uh, across the different shops, you know, certainly for those that do a lot of mail order work, it's been, it's been re relatively, I would say, unaffected overall. Like a lot of people are still ordering gear. Uh, there hasn't been a lot there for, for shops that were affected and maybe considered a non-essential business that were closed down or, or compelled to do only curbside pickup. Obviously, there's been, you know, a pretty big hit there, but it's been pretty variable. I think we've spoken with people on both ends of the spectrum who have actually done better now than they have usually um, at this time of year because a lot of people are, you know, they're, they have more time and, they, and they've been fishing more, whereas yep. others have been really heavily affected uh, depending on the region and, and the type of fishing that's going on. So it's definitely not been, it's not been quite as, you know, there, 
in most cases, there was not a, an explicit state directive to close down completely. Sure. So I think it's been a little bit more of a mixed response. I don't know if you have appreciate- anything else to add on that, Tony. I think that I think that um, you know a lot a lot of our shops, uh, you know, fly the fly fishing community is pretty incredible. Uh, I'm always surprised at at how tight knit it is and what good people are part of it. And I think word got out pretty quickly that the fly shops were getting killed, and and in those shops that had an online presence. Um, you know, I think the community really rallied around them as much as possible for placing those online orders or curbside pickup, things like that. Um, it's still devastating. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just, there's no, there's no two ways about it. It's, it's devastating. Uh, we're probably going to lose some of them throughout all of this. And, and that's, that is a cry and shame. Um, but our, our community rallied around, all the small businesses that are dependent upon them. And, and I think they helped out as much as they could. It's just, I, I, it's a very weird place, Rob. Yeah, for sure. It's been a crazy year. What was that? I saw the meme there. It was back to the future is the doc and uh, Michael J. Fox. He says, whatever you do, don't make sure you don't land on 2020. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this has definitely been one of those years you didn't want to land on if you were in a time machine. Uh, but at the same time, you know, um, uh, there's been a, an amazing amount of rallying around families and rallying around support and communities. So, well, we've all been affected. Um, there's, there's obviously silver linings to this as well. So my, my two cents I'll throw in there. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you about, Tony, cause I know you work in Washington a lot and as well as you, uh, Willie is Tony, if you could kind of start us what does it look like to work within the the walls of the Capitol or some of those areas that you have to work and fight for the fisheries community? I mean, a lot of people don't know what it's like to to walk around and knock on doors for senators and, and congressmen and representatives, and you're there representing the fishing community, maybe in a flannel like you have right there, Don. Maybe you have to wear a suit and tie. I'm not exactly sure. It'd be a suit and tie, Rob. Suit and tie? <laughs> yeah, suit and tie. Okay, no flannels, no waiters? No, no, flannels, no waiters no allowed? Waiters. No. And this, <laughs> is, this isn't quite as long either, buddy. <laughs> this will go under a trim when they open the hill back up. That'd be this funny. Is my, if this, t- my COVID, this is my COVID look, so... That'd be funny if they saw you coming, Tony, and they hung a sign outside the Capitol, no waiters, no you know, yeah, waiting booths yeah, allowed. Yeah, leave your waiters up that. Leave your waiters in the umbrella holder. Yeah. yeah. But um, what is it like to work in Washington and kind I'll, of fight for these issues? So I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, for, the, for, for people who, who have never been, you know, to D.C. or never worked in, the, in those policy situations or are unfamiliar with that community, it's actually an awful lot better than you would give it credit for. Um, you know, I will tell you that the staffers are dedicated, committed people. They don't make very much. I mean, you, you would be shocked uh, at how little they make, you know, with an annual salary for, for the responsibility that's on their shoulders. Um, a, a lot of them, most of them that I've met care deeply about what they do. Um, you know, the, the elected officials, uh, senators, House of Representatives, most of them that I have met are regular people. Uh, they're looking for trusted sources of information. So the more knowledgeable that you are, the more reasonable that you are, the better that you are at developing relationships. You, you, you're not, you know, you're not knocking on a door and making a cold call what you're doing is, you know, three weeks in advance is talking to a staffer that you know and saying, hey, I'm bringing some advocates in, um, bringing some advocates into town. You know, does your boss have a time to meet? And it's very cordial. It's very professional. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot better than you think. And it takes a long time to get there and develop those relationships and become a trusted resource. But I think that's the goal of anyone who does this. So, you know, when you're a staffer on Capitol Hill, you have a portfolio and that portfolio contains your scope of work. And it depends a lot if you're, what committees your boss is on. Um, It depends a lot on, you know, what state they're from, what matters to them. 
So, you know, your portfolio might include everything from energy to pharmaceuticals to bullying in schools and fisheries. So you look at the scope that these people have to understand, the staffers, and then you really appreciate the fact that like when something hits the fan or, there, or the senator runs in and says, there's a vote on this at three o'clock today, tell me everything you know about it, you have 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and the staffers are all running around in a panic, that staffer picks up the phone and calls you and says, what do you know about this? how can you help me? Like, I, I need, you know, wh what's going on. And all of a sudden, you know, you're in a position because you've had a meaningful, positive relationship with them for years to be guiding them through the nuance of what you specialize in understanding that they may have seven or different seven or eight different things in their portfolio. And it's just an impossible task for them to know everything about everything. So you've and been doing this for how you've been, kind of working in Washington and working on policies for how long now, Tony? Uh, in Washington for like six years now. Okay. And in the state and regional level for 20 something years. Okay. So the, the, a, you know, the American Saltwater Guides Association has been around only for a couple of years, if yeah. I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So prior to that, I mean, do you have to have a platform or position to get a time with the congressman you said you're working with staffers and you're working with their bosses and you're establishing these meetings do you need a platform or a position to call up and say i'd like to request time with this congressman so how does like that work it's ref it's reflective on what legislation is is on the table and where that legislation is in the process but i mean as far as you though like when you call and say i want to come and speak to you about these policies that do they actually say well who are you like before you've established not. that. I hope not. That would be awful. Well, not now, but like, to, <laughs> yeah. do you have to have, my question is, do you have to have a platform? Can I call, can I get time with Congressman in Washington? It's, it's relative to what legislation is active right now. So if I, it's a, so because, you know, the, as Willie mentioned, Magnuson Stevens was, they were looking at reauthorizing it and they were pretty far down the road in the process before this COVID stuff hit, but it's been put on hold. So if I called, you know, Congressman XYZ and said, Hey, I wanted to talk to Magnus. And that what they would say is why, or, you know, we're not, we're not working yeah. on that for the next couple of months. I would say there's, there's no like set rule there, Rob. I think generally, you know, most offices are open to taking a meeting with whoever wants to take a meeting. I think that's a pretty general, you know, general theme across offices. I will say that, you know, if you are part of a coalition, you're bound to have a much greater effort. Or if you're, if you're like myself and Tony, who are working on behalf of a lot of other people, Right. Um, you know, who have, who have you know, stated their commitment to, you know, their, their share of your beliefs, you're going to have a lot more value. I think, you know, in terms of individuals, a lot of that comes through in submitting letters. So if there's a certain issue that a lot of people feel strongly about, um, you know, an office might get a lot of letters on that. And this is a case in which like a form letter might actually be useful because of, a, you know, if there are tens of thousands of fishermen submitting a letter on behalf of something, even if it is a form letter, that can, that can go a long way because then the metrics sure. you know, show that a lot of people uh, take the time and really care about this. And, kind of like what we're doing with the pebble. Kind every of like what we're doing with and the Senator Rob has, has in district offices as well. Yep. So, you know, like my Congressman has an office like two miles from my house. So if I was, if I was just a, you know, a, a private fisherman who wanted to talk about an issue, I wouldn't request a meeting on Capitol Hill. Right. I would go to his in-district office and develop my relationships from there. The, the neat thing about Capitol Hill is they're all centralized. <clears throat> so if I want to cover an issue on Magnus and Stevens and I need to talk to the senators from Maine, Massachusetts, New York, Maryland, and, and Virginia, yep. I can do that all in one day. That's great. And I, that's awesome. Thank you for bringing that up because that actually makes a lot, a lot of sense. Tony. Yeah, so I, wanted, I, I wanted to add one more thing, um, Rob, which is, you know, in addition to our doing this work, I mean, you know, when, when the world resumes some semblance of normalcy, uh, Tony and I will obviously be on the Hill a lot. Another thing that ASJ really works hard to do is to educate and empower our membership to, to be effective advocates themselves. And so that's, 
that's a big priority for us. You know, we recognize that, you know, we, we have a lot of folks who share our values and our beliefs and we try to give them the tools that they need to be effective advocates. And for that end, we actually hosted a webinar this past Tuesday um, that I think will be shared on Facebook eventually, um, kind of showing, um, you know, sh sharing some case studies of, of the examples in which, you know, our folks have been effective advocates and also um, providing some, you know, some tools that they can use to, uh, to, better, uh, to, to better get their message across to those who need to hear it. That's awesome. We are coming down to our uh, time, guys. But before we do, I want to bring up a couple of things. One, I want to talk, well, at the end, I want to talk about your membership, your social media, how people can get connected. But before we get into the connecting points, I do want to talk about a recent win that you guys had. Tony, maybe you can start and then also Willie can jump in that you guys had with the, you know, the striped bass and change in some of the policies in regards to the striped bass in the Northeast and Maybe you can explain that recent win you guys had back, I don't know if it's been a couple months now or so. So um, like Willie said, we just did a how to be a better advocate uh, webinar. And um, part of that webinar was a case study on Rhode Island. And uh, we were able to engage our membership, our board member, uh, Peter with Saltwater Edge, our chairman. We have a pretty big footprint in Rhode Island. And all the Northeast states were, were being consistent with the regulations, which, which we advocated heavily for. You know, a slot limit for striped bass is not a slot limit if you can kill a big one in another state, right? It's, it's a coastal slot limit. That's how it works. Yeah. So um, the slot limit passed uh, 28 to 35 inches in the ocean. And Rhode Island wanted to separate the sectors and allow certain sectors to kill bigger fish. And it looked like it was going to go through and we were able to exert an enormous amount of pressure on the state of Rhode Island. And even though it made it through all of their state councils and was approved by, I don't know the title, like the assistant uh, fisheries director or the fisheries director, when it got to the tip top uh, waited to, waiting to be signed, um, Director Coit in Rhode Island responded to our pressure, our conservation message, the message from other states that, you know, the management strategy that we're trying <clears throat> to use to recover the striped bass stocks out of a slot limit is not effective if one state isn't using it, especially with the aggregation of large fish off Block Island and in Rhode Island waters. You know, these are the fish that we're trying to protect with a slot limit. So if you can kill them, it's kind of taking us a step backwards. And, um, and we, you know, we had articles and papers, we had op-eds, we had members sending letters and, you know, full, full engagement in Rhode Island. And honestly, we thought we lost. And at the very last second, God bless her, Director Coit uh, took all that information and said, you know what, these guys have a point. She overrode the decisions of the state fisheries councils and Rhode Island ended up joining all the other states in the Northeast with a clear and concise size and creel limit for striped bass that was consistent with the rest of the states. So that, that's a small, that is a very, very small victory. But, you know, if you do things correctly and you develop these relationships and you're reasonable and you use science, you can get a very, very smart person like Director Coit who, who understands this and, and actually does put the resource first to say, hey, wait a minute, these guys are right. This is what we need to do. Willie, and, what uh, was the old um, limits or what was the old regulations? You mean for the stripers? To, I mean, previous to this, it was what, one fish of 28 inches, Tony, and two, in, two fish of 28 inches until what, 2015 or so? Yep. So this was an effort to kind of, you know, to rein in harvest, especially on those larger fish, so the 35 inch maximum. So now so instead it's of a, instead of a minimum size limit, striped bass have a maximum size limit now because um, there's a really the population of large fish like over 45 inches is incredibly low, um, and these are the oldest fish. They produce the most eggs. So eggs what's the fish. slot limit now? If you wanted to keep a striper of something, not I would, but say somebody wanted to keep a striper, how does it work now? On the ocean, it varies state by state. Okay, <laughs> so like don't. Yeah. New Jersey has a bonus tag system, you know, Maryland in the Chesapeake Bay has different limits because they're a producer area. Same thing with Delaware Bay, but by and large for the coast, 
it's 28 inch minimum to 35 or under maximum. So, so 28 to 35 is a slot limit. If somebody wanted to keep in say Massachusetts, they could do one. Yes. And then anything bigger than 35 has to go back. Yeah. And that's this year. Yep. yep. That's awesome. Well, good guys. I, you know, it's been a blast to have you guys on. I want to give everybody uh, your social media channels and your website for more information and then how they could become a member. I know you guys have a free membership, right? Yep. And then you do have a donation program where if somebody wanted to become a donor, they could participate in the donation program. So Willie, if you could kind of help us with your website and then the membership. Yep. Uh, the website is www.saltwaterguidesassociation.com. So, you know, same, uh, pr pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you can find us on Facebook. We are, um, you know, American Saltwater Guides Association. And what is, what is the website? It's Salt H2O Guides, Tony. Is yeah, the, right? tag, the tag for tag. Facebook is Salt H2O Guides. Same thing for Instagram. Salt yep. H2O Guides on Facebook and Instagram. Yep. Yep. Well, guys, it's been a blast to have you on. Yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Enjoy. Rob. No, it's been really fun and uh, we'll stay tuned and we'll keep, you know, keep updated with what you guys are working on. And I appreciate all the work you do. You guys are going to be at the fly fishing shows in some form or fashion next year. Oh, uh, we will, we will have a booth and hazmat suits if need be. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it's all going to be gone. We're going to be fine by 2000 and 2020, 2021 is going to be all in the past. From your <laughs> lips to God's ears. Here's Rob. hoping. <laughs> Amen. All right. Hang tight there, guys. I'm going to shut right. off our streams. Appreciate Thank it, you, Rob. buddy. Thanks, guys. Bye. Yeah.